so thankful for you today. So sorry about my voice. It's my pleasure this morning to introduce you to a very old friend of mine. Um, I have known Terrence Sutton since we were both quite young, before there was any gray um, in, our, in our hair anywhere, um, and uh, have been delighted to journey with him for these decades now as he has come up in the Lord and come up in ministry, and he's now the pastor at Tahoe Forest Church in Northern California in the Lake Tahoe area. He and his wife, Kate, I did their wedding 43 years ago. Can you believe that? It was, it was many years ago. I, how many years was it? 19 years ago, I, I did their wedding 19 years ago. Give it up for them. That is an amazing run. They have three beautiful children, Torn and Violet and Sully, and uh, we've been just enjoyed being friends with them and supporting and encouraging each other in ministry over these years. And uh, I am delighted that he's going to come and bring the word to you today. Would you please welcome the pastor of Tahoe Forest Church, Terrence Sutton. Thank you, Pastor Steve. Uh, love Pastor Steve. He's invested in me since, um, man, I was in middle school, really. I think he was 19 when he came to Calvary Church, and that's where I was, and uh, so grateful for he and Jesse and their relationship. Uh, I have 30 minutes or so, and I know that the series is Fresh Wind, and I was talking to Pastor Steve last night, and um, just really felt like I wanted to talk about the subject of free. And right now we're in a series, Miss My Home Church. Uh, we have actually a three-time Olympian, two-time gold medalist preaching in the pulpit this Sunday. Y'all are running marathons. I don't know what I'm doing with my life. Um, feeling kind of lazy. Uh, but I do know that God has been doing big things in Tahoe. Uh, just the last couple of weeks, people have been set free from bondage, from addiction, Relationships, marriages have been healed and restored. Reconciliation is taking place. People are finding resources that they need. And so let me just give you this um, intro before we dive in too deep. Is This morning is for some of you. It may be for your spouse. Maybe it's for your kid. Maybe it's for your best friend, your neighbor, your coworker, your boss, your employee. But whatever it is, I want you to take it and I want you to believe in it. Because God says that we were meant to be free. In fact, we're going to read a passage that says that we're called to freedom. And the question that some of us have is if God wants me to be free, and God calls me to be free, then why are there things in my life that I wish weren't there? Why are there parts of me that I wish were not true of me? Why are there memories that still haunt me? or habits that are inconsistent with my faith. Behavior, addictions, claws that are plunged into the very fiber of my soul. Things that I don't even want to talk about and I really hope that someone doesn't find out about. There's this letter in the Bible called Galatians. One of the first missionaries, Paul, wrote it around 48 A.D. There's just one line I want us to read, and then uh, we have a main passage we're going to get to in the Gospel of John. It says, you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Right? Not, not my, my subjects or my slaves or my employees. You're, you're, you're my peer. And so I'm not speaking down to you when I'm talking about freedom. Paul says, I got my history too. We were all peers called to freedom. Now, I don't know about you, but I grew up in Naperville, not far from here, and the backyard's all connected. And whenever it was dinner time, my mom would whistle three loud times, and we would just come running. It'd be, you know, playing like I was Michael Jordan in the driveway. Then I'd hear, doot, doot, doot. I gotta go. And I'd run, run home for dinner. I knew what it meant to be called. <laughs> Here's the wonderful thing. God is calling us to freedom, meaning that there are some of us, perhaps many of us, possibility that it's all of us that aren't living in absolute freedom right now, that aren't where God desires us to be, that we're not who we were always meant to be. So let's start with this. Can you think of a time, I just brought up that fun memory of being in the backyard as a kid. Can you think of a time that you felt freedom? Maybe you were six years old running through a sprinkler on a hot summer day in July, or maybe you were 16 in the car for the first time 
look in the rear view mirror, no one's with you and you're going on the open road. That's so dangerous. Oh my gosh. Remember that? Or maybe you left where you grew up and you were finally out of the house or your kids finally have financial freedom. Is that true for any of the parents? Any 40 year olds still living at home? Yeah, me too. I'm just kidding. Uh, Kate and I had a difficult pregnancy. We're so blessed to have twins and they were really high risk twins. And so Kate had to live on a hospital bed with monitors on her stomach for the whole last tri trimester. And, um, and then when they were born, they were in the NICU and then they were in the pick you, uh, and then they were in the hospital a little bit longer. And then we had a pediatric gastroenterologist for a whole year. And it was just a very long road. We, we grew to know the nurses, the doctors intimately at this children's hospital. It was probably an entire year of our life that we were hospitalized and did all this stuff. And I just remember when we finally had the girls and we put them in the car seats and we were driving away from the hospital. I was like, man, this feels good. That season of my life is over. That is ended now on to what life is supposed to be like. I wonder, can you conjure up a feeling of freedom? of being done with something that you wish weren't happening to you or in you or through you. And you're like, man, I am oh, I'm free of that. Finally, that is over. Well, we're able to have a victorious life, a, a free life. And I want you to, if you're joining us online or if you're here in person, I want you to really enter into this and let's make this moment special. Let's make this important. See, God wants us to be free. But here's what happens, and here's the first truth this morning. Bondage lives in secret. Sin seeks isolation. It doesn't want to be talked about. It doesn't want this to be a subject. And so you're sitting here, and some of us, as we're going, this, we're going through this in Tahoe, I was talking to some guys, and uh, they said, you know, as you, as you were talking, I was kind of squirming in my seat because I was thinking, like, like what my thing is. And it doesn't want to be talked about. Like, even in fact, right now, there's people that probably want to turn off this computer or some that want to walk out of this room being like, I don't need to hear this right now because I got to keep this a secret. I got to keep this in, in isolation. The book of wisdom written by King Solomon in 950 BC says it this way in Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 10. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has... No one to help them up. See, we know this. Sin is embarrassing, right? It leads to embarrassment. It leads to shame. It might even offend others or disappoint somebody who, who believes in us that we're better than that. It may make us look bad or foolish or sick or lesser. So instead, what do we do? We hide it. We keep it. And then we end up like protecting it and, and feeding it and nourishing it. See, a healthy reaction from others should lead us to change. You're right. That's not who I am. Yeah, I should, this shouldn't be a part of me or a part of me. I shouldn't be thinking about that stuff anymore. I should let that go. That's not how I'm supposed to act. But instead of change, we keep it. And it's lied about. And it becomes bondage. And it becomes the new normal. And for so long, so many people that we love, that we care about, and perhaps it's even us, live a life limping, and damaged, and lesser than what God promises for us. That what he calls us to, what he says is possible, what he's calling us to, it says in Galatians, right? And this is a dangerous, scary, lonely place to be in these chains that exist within us. James, we're going to visit twice today. We're going to start here in chapter 1, verse 13 through 15, and we'll visit chapter 5 at the end. One of the apostles says, And remember, when you're being tempted, do not say, God's tempting me. God is never tempted to do wrong, and he never tempts anyone else. Temptation comes from our own desires, which entice us and drag us away. These desires give birth to sinful actions, and when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. Did we catch how that runs that path it starts with temptation right then it leads to desires then to sinful actions then to sin as it grows and then to death see this church i love new city church five years it's it's amazing there's so many stories already coming out of it and this church exists so you can be healthier yeah 
and um, have better relationships and thrive as your true self. All those things are true of this church. But really, the root cause of this church is that you can have new life in Christ. That's the, that's the main reason. If you boil it all down, why are we here? It's because Jesus changes everything. See, we're desiring and yearning for this freedom because the health, the present, our future, and our eternity, our very soul is affected by it. So Jesus wants you to hear this, each and every one of us. And I'm here for, I don't know, 2,000 miles away, and there is people's lives who are being transformed in Tahoe with this truth. And there's lives that are going to be here this morning and online. They're going to be transformed with this truth because God's word always returns to us. So let's look into this. Galatians 5.13, you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. So let's just ask ourselves a simple question right now. Self-inventories, there's something in you that shouldn't be there. Let's put the finger right on the pulse of your soul. Is there a habit? Is there a memory that keeps reoccurring that still has some sway or hold on you? Is there an addiction? Is there a bondage? And then if you ask past yourself, is there a spouse? Is there someone that you love? Is there a friend? What is it for you? I mean, the list is really easy that we could throw up there, right? Oh, we actually have a list. Okay. <laughs> Just kidding. I wrote it. Um, <laughs> anger, lust, greed, selfishness, food, reputation, substance, drug, alcohol, pornography, past memories, relationship, sin. That's the catch-all, right? Whatever it is. And as this is on here, leave it on here for a second. Let's make everybody feel really uncomfortable. Is your eye going straight to yours? There's not more than two on this list that apply to you, is there? Oh, you're a terrible person, right? Why is it? Why is it that Jesus is, all right, get off the list. We're all being weird now. Why is it that Jesus says, let me take that from you? And we're like, ah, do I want, do I want to give it? I kind of want to give it to you, Jesus. I know that I should, but but I think I'm going to hold on to it just a little bit longer. Just one more time. Or I just can't quite picture my life without it. I know it's strange to say that I don't want this to be a part of me, but yet it's been a part of me, and I'm, I'm not quite sure how it goes without this. And Jesus says, allow me to break those chains off of you. I mean, we just sang that this morning, being set free. If you have your Bibles, here's our passage, John chapter 5, or your apps, you can turn there. We'll have verses on the screen. Verses 2 through 9. You're going to see a word, and we're going to give you the definition in a second. It's Bethesda. Look out for it. Here's some quick context. And you've probably heard this passage before if you grew up in church, or um, maybe they've taught it here before. There is no active miracles being taking place. Like there's no miracle worker that people go to at this point. And so there's this word on the street that there's this pool and this, it's called Bethesda. And the, 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 the rumor, the legend has it that an angel would come and stir the water periodically. And when it did, whoever jumped in the pool would be healed of whatever infirmity they had. And so as you can imagine, those who believe this are surrounding this pool and they're spending all of their days and nights just staring at that water, just hoping that maybe it'll start stirring. And if so, they can get in and whatever's wrong with them will be made whole. Now there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cured, he picked up his mat and he walked. Now the Bible says that this man suffered from this condition for 38 years. He's by the pool, and Jesus goes up to him and asks what we kind of think would be a crazy question is, do you want to get well? Well, obviously, Jesus, right, 38 years of suffering. He's by the pool. Obviously, that's the, the only thing this guy wants is all he's thinking about, isn't it? 
You can't walk. That's a crazy question. He, he wants to be healed. Now, Bethesda in Hebrew and Aramaic can mean two, one of two things. And they're really different options here. One is shame and grace, or shame and disgrace, shame and disgrace, or house of mercy, house of grace. It could mean two extremes. And this is where this man is. This is where he's living, right there with this option. Disgrace and shame, or mercy and grace. And Jesus is literally asking this man, this is where you're at. You're on this razor's edge. There's a fork in the road in front of you, and you get to pick it. Do you really want this? Because you could easily go continue on with shame and disgrace and secrets. And like we've been talking about limping through life, and this is not who you're supposed to be, but it's part of, part of you now, and then it's like keep that secret, keep feeding it. Or Jesus says, or you could live in this house of grace and mercy. Do you really, do you really want this? And it's interesting because it says 38 years. He only had excuses at this point. So instead of yelling out an obvious, enthusiastic, yes, yes, with all my heart and being, I want to be healed. I want to be made well, Jesus. He begins to list excuses, right? Well, I don't have anybody to help me really get better. Well, you know what? When I try to get in, someone else cuts in front of me. He's literally on the edge of the tipping point of shame and disgrace. His entire life could change. He'll live in the house of mercy and grace. And what does he do? Now, I want you to focus with me right here. He knows something's wrong. He knows it. It's no surprise. Jesus knows that there's something going on with him that should not be. They both know this. And Jesus says, point blank, do you want this to change? Do you want to be healed? Do you want to get well? And what does this man do? How does he respond? He makes excuses. I wonder if we've ever done this. Jesus, you say this could be true of me. I'm supposed to want that to be true of me too. And most of me really does. Well, why isn't it then? Why is that still a part of you? Why do you lose control of your temper? Why are you still so impassioned with lust and looking at pornography? Why is alcohol still so tempting to you? Why is vanity still so important to you? Why is the memory, the shame of the past still inflicted upon you? Why whatever, you fill in the blank. Do we make excuses? What is our reason? Jesus says that we are called to freedom, that we are meant to be free. And Jesus is asking this guy, do you want this or not? We say, I think I do. I mean, I'm supposed to. Well, then why isn't it? Is it possible to live in the freedom that Jesus calls us to? See, God knows what our bondage is. And Jesus asks us today, do you want to be free? Which house do we choose to live in? Shame and disgrace or mercy and grace. Are we going to continue to make excuses or are we going to be free? See, when Jesus is asking, do you actually desire freedom? Do you want to keep living in this life? And he's asking us this question. He's saying no more excuses. No more blaming of the past. No more looking at other people and saying, well, they did this to me or they didn't do this for me. I'm like this. I feel it because my dad or my lack, de my lack thereof or this or that. I mean, there's a lot of excuses we can come up with as to why. Well, this is genetic or this is this and this. And believe me, my dad was a psychologist for 30 years, had his own counseling practice. I absolutely believe in counseling. I believe in the process believe in all of that, but I also believe that we need to stand on the word of God and ask the Holy Spirit to do his job in our lives. And there's so many people that don't. I did a series on the Holy Spirit a couple years ago, and I was shocked when I found out that so many people didn't pray to the Holy Spirit. You might be thinking, what? I've never done that. Right? It's God. 
So we say, Holy Spirit, will you fill me from head to toe today? Will you convict me of anything that shouldn't be within my heart? And will you convince me of righteousness, of things that are right with me? Will you remind me of your word? Will you guide my path? Will you be the moving compass needle of my soul that always points to true north? May I be who you've intended me to, for me to be. I love this quote by a pastor that I look up to, uh, Mark Patterson. He says, it's never too late to be who you should have been. It's never too late. And for some of you right now, maybe you're getting goosebumps right now. Today's your day. If you're watching this, whenever you're watching it, the Holy Spirit can move in you and touch you, change you, and free you. I want to tell this story. It just happened uh, last week at, at, our, at our home church. And ben, I know you're going to sing again in a little bit, um, but we're going to get ready. We've got 10 minutes here. Uh, there's a man named Jason. And I've known Jason, he doesn't mind if I tell you his story because he told his story this last Sunday. And um, Jason, when he was in high school, he got injured playing football. And he had to get surgery and they prescribed him painkillers. And he said from the minute that he first took those, he's like, he was in love. And then later on, he had another surgery and something else. And he said that it ended up to years of addiction. And then the painkillers were out. He couldn't try to get another reason for a prescription. And he said that he started using heroin and meth. And his family was distraught. And um, just terrible things were happening. And he said finally went to recovery. And he was set free from it. And he couldn't believe it. And everybody cheered, and he was a part of the church, and that was like 15 years ago. And what he said this Sunday, he goes, but what I didn't tell everybody is that I traded that for alcohol. And he goes, and every night, I, he goes, so instead of living my life by the hour, right, when can I take my next pill? Like, like okay, if I just get 90 more minutes, then that, that'll, that'll stave off, you know, the, the withdrawals or whatever. He goes, instead of living my life by the hour, I started living it by the afternoon. And I couldn't wait to get off work and get home. And then I would just down however many beers or white claws or whatever he was doing. And he said, every single night, like I just couldn't wait. And he goes, and it was my secret. Like with my wife, she knew that I would drink, but didn't know to the extent. And my dad knew that sometimes I'd call out sick at work. And Jason said, I had a great life. Family business. My dad loved me. My wife loved me. Teenage boys. He said, and this is who I had become. And Jason's telling this story, and I think we've got a picture. He's telling this story last Sunday at our church. And he goes, and then I thought that I was called to be free because we did a series a couple, you know, a couple weeks ago. And he said, um, and I decided that this is it. And he accepted Christ as the ruler of his life, not just the lover of him. But you rule, and I will follow, and I will say yes and Jason hasn't drank in like a month and a half now. And he was baptized last Sunday. We do it in the Truckee River. So if you love Jesus, I mean, it's cold. You got to really love Jesus to get baptized in Tahoe in September. You guys are in November. You guys going outside? Okay, that mean, you mean it then. Okay. It's official. It's real. And... um and Jason's big thing was like, I didn't, he's like, he was so excited to share his testimony and to talk, but he goes, you know, Terrence, I've been here for 13 years at this church and I feel like a fake because everybody was celebrating that I'm not doing meth or heroin anymore, but every night I'm going home and I'm drinking and I'm not telling anybody. And I have this great testimony and everyone's high-fiving me and hugging me at church. He goes, I just felt like a total phony, like a liar. For a decade of this guy's life, he was feeling this way. I didn't know it. I've known Jason for six years, and I was fooled. I didn't know. And he said, but my wife and my boys, I'm always like wondering, like, are they, do they find out? Do they know? Is my secret safe? How many times have I called out sick this month? Like, where is it? So here's my question, and maybe you can relate to Jason's story, and maybe it's something totally different for you. But the human condition is the human condition, right? 
Scripture, Scripture. It says it starts with temptation, then it leads to, to desire, and then it goes to acts of sin, and then that grows and it leads to death. So Pastor Steve just read this passage today. We, we just participate in communion. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three. It's always read almost. Every time I've ever participated in communion, right? The Apostle Paul says, on the night, you can even say it, Jesus was betrayed. Same night. So who's at the communion table? Who's invited? Who's sitting in that upper room in just hours? Well, we have Jesus the Savior. And we have John, who's faithful till the end. But who else is invited to the communion table? The very first communion table, who else is invited? You have Thomas the doubter. You have Peter the denier. You have everybody else who will abandon Jesus, and you have Judas the betrayer. And Jesus knows all this is going to happen, and he still invites them to the table. More than that, he just washed all of their feet. So when we talk to Jason or we speak to ourselves or those that we love and we say, and I feel so fake or I've done this for so long or is there a place for me? Absolutely. The communion table was made for you. There was no one perfect in that room. That's the point of the broken body and the blood. Because there are things about you and things about me that we just wish were not true. But more than wishing that they weren't true, have we asked the Holy Spirit to make them not true? What is it for you today? Or what is it for a loved one that is in your life? See, we serve the breaker of chains. That's the story of God bringing freedom to where there was in bondage, cleaning what has been dirty, reconciling what has been lost. This is who our God is. So who was at the table today, just now, just this morning? Who was at the communion table with us? Well, I think there was an alcoholic. I think there's somebody who looks at pornography. At our table today, there's someone who's codependent. At our table today, there's someone who's prideful, struggles with greed, who lives with anger in their heart. See, I don't need to convince you of the truth or the depth or the depravity of the sin that is capable of living within a human heart. We've seen it on television this past week. The Holy Spirit does his job, as it says in John 16, 8. So what is our response? What do we do? What action do we put to the desire of freedom, the breaking of bondage, to becoming who we were always meant to be? James, the apostle, the brother of Jesus, in chapter 5 of his letter to the church, verse 13, 14, 15, and 16. Love these verses. Are any among you suffering? They should pray. Are any cheerful? They should sing songs of praise. Are any among you sick? They should call for the elders of the church and have them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise them up. Now listen to this. And anyone who has committed sins will be forgiven. Not might be, not may be. And anyone who has committed sins will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. Here's my prayer for this church, New City Church. It's the prayer that I had for, for my home church just last week. There were fathers who would come for prayer weeping 
confessing. There were marriages that were on the rocks, literally have, have had the divorce papers out on their dining table. I remember this 16-year-old girl that I prayed for and just sobbing and seeing how God was freeing her just in that moment. And so I don't know what it is for you, but I know that God wants you to live free, free from bondage, free from addiction, free from the lies of the enemy, to be who you were always meant to be. So the band's going to close with a song, and that's here in James chapter 5 is to sing songs of praise. But I also spoke to some of the prayer team earlier, some amazing women of faith out there. And I'm going to be over here, and I'll be out there too. And if there's anyone that can pray for you, they're going to be out there. And this isn't a time to say, you know, I think I'm going to go back to hiding this again. I think I'm going to go back to, to feeding this and keeping it a secret and protecting. That needs to end. Let the Holy Spirit be in you with this hope of new life this hope of freedom. And maybe your prayer today is for a spouse or a loved one. But let's follow what scripture says and let's trust the promise of scripture that those who've committed sins will be forgiven and those that are in bondage will be set free. So let's sing this song and then I think Pastor Steve or uh, Pastor Steve is gonna come up as we close. <laughs>